Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hillary, and this is our Power of Work presentation on designing a clinical study protocol. And we have uh, a veteran expert here, Sonia Martinez, <laughs> who will be um, sharing a wealth of um, experience with us. So we're very excited with that. And um, just in general, Power of Work is a nonprofit where we get together and we're just trying to help people gain employment um, through a variety of aspects, including resume review and you know, job hunting, but also things more like this, where we're trying to get people to really develop their careers. Um, so this is ideally designed with somebody who has a little bit of background in um, clinical research. Um, and so this might be a little high level, but we can always go over other topics at another time. So if there's any terms that you don't understand, um, feel free to write them down. We also have um, other videos that go over kind of very entry level, what are different terms within clinical research. Um, so I'll pass it over to Sonia and she'll give a little introduction for herself. Hello everyone, um, my name is Sonia and I've been in the industry for, I'm gonna say 20 plus years. <laughs> and, um, but I tell you, if you guys are looking for a career, um, I think this has been an amazing career for me. So, um, uh, because it's so fulfilling, not only um, um, there's enough jobs for all of us, um, but also because it helps people. And I really, when I started doing this, um, I feel very honored that I can, I've been fortunate enough to make um, medicines, uh, drugs um, to help people. And right now I have a personal friend who has uh, melanoma and my last company, I was working in melanoma and immuno-oncology and I feel really good and I'm, I'm her mentor and it's been a wonderful experience for me and for her to have somebody, uh, I, I'm a good support system for her. So there's many rewards in the uh, in this career. So I'm all for it. Another thing that I like about um, going into clinical research is there's, there's many avenues for that. So anyhow, um, if you have any further questions about this uh, career path, I'm happy to answer them. Um, anyhow, uh, designing a clinical protocol. Um, go to the next <laughs> slide, please. <laughs> so one of the first things that you need to understand in uh, of, there's many aspects of um, a clinical protocol. There's a phase one, which is mainly focused around safety. And then um, phase two has safety and efficacy. That's when you're first starting to uh, think of, is this drug, does this drug have a potential to be efficacious? Um, and that that information comes from doing, uh, first of all, the phase one program, which uh, not only takes safety, but also the kind the population that you would be studying in a, re in a later um, uh, clinical trial. So in phase two, many companies uh, and many protocols fail here. Many companies fail because this is a stage where um, it's a, a go, no go decision for um uh, for the company and many people and many companies um, uh, don't make it to phase three. So um, this is a very critical stage for the phase two um, because then this is when you start exploring in different indications and um, it's very uh, specific. Uh, first, you can start, you know, it's an oncology drug, for example, and um, but you don't know how, you, if, is it going to be a drug that's going to help the kidneys, or um, is it for, for pancreatic cancer? What what mo um, module are you going to be focusing on? So you need to make that decision in in the phase two level, and that's why this phase two is so important for the development of a product. Um, phase three, once you have been and you realize, uh, gee, this this really works in um, melanoma, for example. Um, and then I'm going to focus on melanoma. And then later on, I can also go kidney. But right now, my my most important um, uh, indication would be melanoma. So therefore, my phase three has to then have um, not only the safety, the safety always gets continued, um, but the efficacy part um, is where you're more specific to that indication that you're trying to prove. Um, and you know have various endpoints. So as you're designing your endpoints, you're going to be focusing. How can I 
if I give this drug to the subject or the patient, um, how long do I have to give it for? So many people react to a medication uh, and the duration of, of dosing is very critical. So in the phase three, there that's where you start giving different, um, the early phase three, you start giving different dosage to, to prove your efficacy. And that's where your endpoints come about. Uh, phase four, most usually used for post-approval. So now you made it through phase three and you submitted your, all your data. When you submit your data, um, phase three, two, and one are all included. All the studies have to go to the, um, uh, whether it's the, the European Union, the MAA, or the FDA. But anyhow, uh, phase four handles more the pharmacological, excuse me, pharmacovigilance um, of a drug, drug that has already been approved. Um, so next stage, I just wanted to give you some different phases because that depends on what kind of protocol I'm gonna be developing. This list here, something that's very important, um, people don't say, what's, why am I putting this slide up? Um, here you do all the acronyms and the FDA really looks at this page. It's kind of silly, but if you, you abbreviate something in your protocol and it's not in, that, in this list of abbreviations, sometimes they will reject the protocol for that, for this purpose. Next slide. Um, some background information on the on what you're going to be doing in the first stages of designing this protocol. Um, first of all, you're going to put the summary of what um, any summary of previous clinical trials. For example, if you're going to be writing a protocol for, for phase two, you're going to include the phase one data that you have. You can also, in here, you also give background. You could even put background um, that was done in preclinical. In other words, whether it was a cell therapy drug that you were developing or uh, 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 animal studies that you used to verify yourself to this level. So here you do a summary of ju justifying why you think that this trial should go ahead. Then you also risk the risks and benefits that you're trying to prove here. Uh, and of course, then here's where you identify the dosing regimen, the dosing amount and also the regimen and the treatment period for how long are you going to be giving this drug. Next. Thank you. Um, in this section here, um, you're basically going to, there's different objectives that you can, that you can um, try to prove. And here's where you're trying to um, ask the research question of what is it that I'm trying to define and what, how am I going to be able to differentiate um, uh, the data? And this is where I'm going to try to establish a description of my uh, objectives and what I'm trying to do. For example, on an oncology trial, you want to say, gee, you know, we, we think that this drug um, uh, makes the tumor shrink um, and so that might be one of my primary indications in, in melanoma because the, the tumor can spread very easily and it jumps around in the body. Um, then you want to be able to shrink it and control the growth of this, this um, tumor. And so therefore, one of my primary indications would be to shrink the tumor size. Then the secondary objective would be to extend the extend the the um, uh, quality of life or the life the life expectancy of the subject, right? And so that that would be a, another variable and another objective that I'm trying to prove with this drug. Next. So here, um, as I was saying, there's different uh, endpoints. So primary and endpoints, and you can have many different endpoints that you can try to to um, to study. One of the things when you're trying to design a study, especially in phase two, is not to put so many variables because basically your primary and secondary endpoints are different variables that you're trying to study and measure. But sometimes when you add too many variables and you get a bunch of data, um, then you don't know what it all means because you did not define it properly. Many mistakes that I've seen in, for example, oncology studies too, is that you try to determine different levels of different um, hormones or, or different, um, you know, um, 
cell growths. And then all of a sudden you get all these, you know, samples and then you don't know how to interpret them. And it can make ma very confusing study and cumbersome. And at the end, you don't know if you even answered your questions or what you were trying to study. So here, it's very important that you design a study that is very um, streamlined. It's okay to then have an addendum to that protocol and have um, a, a secondary protocol. If, for example, the first six months you, you were dosed with this, now if you want to then get dose another six months, then we're going to increase the dose and that way you can do it. But don't try to have in a study many different variables at the same time. That's where it gets really um, you know, conflicting with each other. And it, it, to me, it defines a poor, poor, poorly written protocol. So this is where the, the design here, where you're going to be isolating, whether it's a single, um, uh, single dose, in other words, you're going to just give one dose and study it, or are you going to do a comparator? Are you going to be doing double blind? For example, you're going to say, am I going to compare, have some subjects, have some subjects that um, um, have the drugs, and then I have the other subject, I have placebo, right? And then I compare them. Um, or you can even have a, a drug where at first you can, in the phase one, you can give, you can give the drug and then the placebo. And you can study that. How did he behave? What is his plasma levels? What is his blood showing? So you can have the same subject be its own, its own control. So it's very interesting. The, this part of the study design, um, it's uh, very um, uh, flexible here, but you have to define so that you don't get conflicting information. Um, but um, this is where you put in, what, what's my dose? And what, how much, how long am I going to dose? Am I going to dose BID uh, twice a day or just once um, and then and then study the subject? So this is a, a critical part here of how you're going to do, how you're going to do the, you know, dosing for the drug. And of course, there's, there's always packaging and labeling um, and that takes its own life also, but you need to identify in this section here of the protocol, how you're going to package the drug and how you're going to blind it. Um, so that's very important. Next slide. Um, um, going back to the the drug, it's how are you going to store it? Because um, because it's an ICH uh, clinical trial, you have to control it. at all times. You you have to have complete control of your drug, and that means that you have to identify what refrigerator it's going to be, how it's going to be stored, and who has who has um, the ability to open the door in the refrigerator and take out the drug and then take it to the nurse who's going to administer. So this is a part how it, it gets controlled here. Uh, and it also includes how many times you're going to dose, like I said earlier. Um, and also here, um, in this part of the study, you're going to put how long the subject's going to come in. Are they going to come in once a week for a checkup? And you're going to study the drug. If It depends on the half-life of, of the drug as to how long you think the drug will be ex excreted from the body. So therefore, if you think that this drug is going to um, last 30 days for it to be washed out, out, of, out of your body, then you need to have them come in and get blood samples so that you know exactly when subjects are free of the drug. And then if you want to dose again, once they're free, then that's fine. But that's where the study design and you have to indicate in your protocol um, how often you're going to be monitoring that information. Um, and so, um, and you have to, per, per, you want to follow the drug, you want to follow your subject or patient um, in follow-up visits until there's no drug left. And that's important for, for those studies. Um, and then sometimes um, a, a protocol will have randomization schedules so that you, you, you put your drug and it goes to a, a, a depot and, and then they, the statistician um, does a randomization and they have a randomization of use for this subject, he's going to get vial number one. For this other subject, he's going to get vial 20. And so it's randomized and people, the, the, physician, the physician or the study site doesn't know what the drug is that they're giving and neither does the sponsor who's interested in the study, who's running the study. So that's important there. 
Um, but there's many different types of protocols and sometimes they have randomization, especially in phase three, it's important to have the uh, randomization codes because that, that proves to the FDA that you don't need, that the drug is being um, used um, properly and that you don't have any control of when you, you don't have any selection for what patient you're using because it, it just gets randomized. You have no control of when this drug is administered. So this is, that's mainly for phase three. Next slide. Oh, uh, next slide. This is a very important section. And in this section, as, as well as the rest of the, um, the protocol, the inclusion and exclusion criteria is, this is where you state the rules of your protocol. Who is going to qualify to be part of the study? And this is where you define the rules of what you're testing and who you're sampling and who your patient population is. Um, right now, um, for example, here I have an example of uh, many studies that you don't want to use women of childbearing potential. And there's a lot of things that a lot of rules that you have to do uh, if you want to use uh, a young person um, who's like pre menopausal like up to gauge 45, um, that's considered somebody who can get pregnant. And so therefore you have to have different rules and they have to have birth control and they look at the partner, the partner may have to use uh, contracept contraceptives too. Um, but that's an example of where you really create the controls on who's allowed into the study. Now, if it was a hormonal drug and that you wanted women, then you would do that. Um, you know, include the different criteria and include women that you would say pre-menopausal or um, uh, post-menopausal. One of the things that is going right now in the industry now is that you need to include people, uh, persons with diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. One of the issues is that many times um, that many populations like American Indian, uh, Blacks, uh, Hispanics, uh, have not been counted in and most of the drugs were and the, the people were like white and so therefore the population needs to be diverse enough so that you, you will find that different um, the, uh, ethnic or racial groups will react differently to the same drugs so the bioequivalence and the bioavailability it may be different for the different racial um, population and so therefore it's important that you have in your study you have to almost align and that's one of the data that the FDA looks at is how many people were black how many people were Asian how many people who were Hispanic and how many people so you want to have a mixture of everything otherwise um, the the FDA could reject that data and say you didn't you didn't prove your hypothesis because you didn't have enough blacks in the study. So right now, um, pe one of the, that's one of the difficulties in running clinical trials is that you want to have and attract diverse populations. So um, another thing that I was going to say about the inclusion exclusion criteria, and sorry if I'm going really fast because um, I could spend a day here talking about protocol design, but um, one of the things, all these activities, you need to create case report forms. And the case report form, as you're designing your protocol, and you're saying, I'm excluding this person, for example, I'm excluding this person because he's obese, right? Um, and so therefore, um, there, there's going to be one of the questions that I'm going to ask in my protocol, I will not allow a person who has a BMI of 50. Right. Um, but what happens if he's 38 or 40.5? Am I allowed to use them in my study? So there's this is the criteria in inclusion exclusion criteria, where in the case report form, you have to ask, you create your case report forms, and that means that all those inclusions and exclusions that you lined in your protocol need to be part of the case report form because that's where it gets counted. So this is very important that. Uh, you include every single thing that you have for your inclusion and exclusion in your case report forms. That's case report forms is where you're uh, collecting the data and documenting um, your data. Next slide, please. Um, okay, informed consent. The informed consent is a very, again, important part, a document where it has to provide um, 
information to the subject or the patient of what um, what is being what is going to be happening to them in the duration of the of the study, and um, you it's important because there's many patients. Um, safety is is one thing, but more most important things like in order to qualify a subject to be part of your study is that they need to be clear on what's going to happen. In other words, they a consent says, yes, please put me in your study. So before you sign that you will participate in the study, you need to be clear and you need to be able to read this consent form uh, and that needs to be provided and read, readable uh, to, uh, I think it's fifth grade level. So I like uh, any anybody can read this and understand it. So you can't use technical terms in that sense um, that the person may not understand. Um, and then let's say there's gonna, if it's a PK study that you're studying, um, pharmacokinetic study, um, you need to be able to inform them that during the study, I'm gonna bleed you five times per day, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, it, um, I'm trying to find out how the drug is reacting and when it's excreted. So in order for me to do that, I have to bleed you a time zero or before, before I dose you. And then at the next 30 minutes after I dosed you, and then 60 minutes, 90 minutes, all the way to 24 hours, okay? Um, and so they need to be clear of, you know, uh, what, first of all, you want to find out whether you have good veins to be drawn or not. And so therefore, if you know that you don't have good veins, then you shouldn't participate in, a, in that, kind of, that kind of study. So in the informed consent, you say, no, I don't consent to be part of this trial because I don't qualify because I don't have the right blood or um, veins for to draw. So here it has to define and inform you clearly uh, what's gonna happen throughout the whole duration of the study. Next, next slide. Again, um, adverse events reporting. This is very important uh, because you need, we need to report, you need to define, first of all, what adverse events you would be um, expecting. And that's that information comes from previous studies that you did um, or previous even animal uh, reactions that you saw. Um, uh, for example, with uh, immuno-oncology and you do infusions, one of the side effects of the infusion um, is that uh, you get um, urticardia, for example, um, because all of a sudden you're injecting uh, a, a product and it's attacking the cells. Uh, um, so therefore you will get a rash very quickly. And it's almost like, like 10 minutes after you start itching and you get a rash. But that means that the drug is working, but it's still reported as an adverse event and it needs to be documented and identified what happened and how long did this rash last. Um, so that's important, but that needs to be documented because later on, if the drug gets approved, people know that one of the side effects, although it, uh, as you go along with your treatment, uh, let's say you have melanoma and you had the study, the, the drug says, well, when you inject this product, it, it's has a propensity to give you urticaria during the infusion, but then 30 minutes later, you you it, it, it will work because the urticaria goes away and then you don't itch and you don't feel itchy. But if you feel itchy, you can give them an antihistamine so that they don't itch. So, but the adverse report event has to be still reported and documented properly. And that's part of your safety and, and efficacy. Uh, parameters that you do, because that's how you establish, gee, the drug works, but it has side effects. And what? how do I know that it has side effects? Because we had an adverse event um, during we, when we did the trials, right? And that's how, when you create your labels for the drug, all this, the way you create your, your drug label is by stating the side effects and what adverse events could happen during your um, uh, during the administration of the product. Go next slide, please. So here, uh, treatment of the subject. 
Um, and again, um, this is where you identify how many, how you're going to be uh, administering the product and for how long. And, and then if you're administering the study, um, what's permitted? Let's say you, you're giving immune, uh, an immuno um, oncology product and you have the rash. So you have a rash and I'm treating you and my product is going to shrink your tumor, which is great. But meanwhile, I had um, a rash when I first got the infusion. Um, but, and, but one of the things that is permitted is for me to get um, an antihistamine. Um, it doesn't affect me in a negative way, but it gets my rash and itchiness away. Um, and the drug is still working. So while you're in the in while you're getting treated and you have your medication because you want to shrink your your tumor, um, you can have antihistamines, and it doesn't have a, a conflict with the what you're studying. Um, so that's one of the the, the things of what the, can happen. Um, another uh, data point here is how you're going to collect the data. This is very important. Like I said. We collect the data in case report forms, and those case report forms, um, um, once a time, once upon a time in my days, uh, we did this by hand, but now it all gets entered into an EDC and IRT, which is actually a lot easier. I love uh, checking uh, e the EDC and entering the data because it makes it a lot e easier to document. So that's one of the advantages. And IRT um, is when you, Remember, I mentioned that there was um, a double blind study or randomized study. If if it's randomized, then the IRT is how contains the randomization schedule. And so that's how that gets designed. So it's very important aspects. If you're going to be randomizing, you have to use an IRT uh, so that the drug gets distributed to the subject and you're not making a decision on what dosage or what strength you're going to be giving and and for how long so that gets all decided during the IRT because the study is randomized and um uh, let's see so it's very computerized there nowadays with data collection which is wonderful um and then when you have collected your data the data access has to be controlled also um, because you have to say um, or I was going to, I should have said this earlier, but when you're collecting data uh, in the treating, the subjects are, are screened so that they're given a number and um, you don't know the, the um, name of the person for privacy reasons. And, um, but then to monitor the study, you need to go back and look at to monitor the study and make sure that the site that was running the trial and had the patients and enrolled the patients, the monitor has to have access um, to the data and, and the um, medical records for that individual. So in here in the protocol, you'll say who you give access for that, um, uh, to let's say the monitor that goes to the site to evaluate the, the trial to make sure that it was compliant with the regulations. Um, so that this needs here in this section, you give permission to who can have access to the data. And, um, and again, you have to have uh, any identifiers um, need to be released to that patient, but then those, that data is only for like half an hour. And then all of a sudden you get locked out. So this here gives you that data access and for how long. And that's, like it says here, address uh, all studies related for monitoring audits and regulatory inspections. Um, next. Statistical methods. Um, here, remember I talked about the, um, the randomization schedules that, that you do. So if you're going to be using... Um, a randomization, you need to have a stat biostatistician create that schedule. And um, and then the, in order for them to do a statistical analysis, they need to know the number of subjects that you're going to do it, how many sites you're going to be using, and the total number of, of uh, subjects you plan to enroll per site. Because in the formula for the statistical analysis, you need to take all those variables into account. So for example, 
you you want you say okay I have ten centers and I have I'm I'm studying a hundred uh, subjects and so and I have ten sites and I want each site to do 10, 10, 10, 10 subjects to enroll 10 subjects. But then what happens when, you know, site number one enrolls, but site number two gets two subjects that throws off your statistical analysis. So therefore you want to have, when you do a screening on letting sites come into your study, you need to make sure that they have the right patient population so that they can enroll those subjects that you need for your multi-center study so that otherwise the statistical will be skewed. And you need to account for um, the statistician will have to say, gee, we can't use the data from this site because he only had two subjects and it really affects my numbers. What happens, however, what people do in your this, uh, can't say that word statistical plan um, you can say um, it, if a site doesn't only enrolls two people um, I can give it to another site right and then um, so then that site can then instead of 10 they can do 18 if they have the patient population but uh, then the statistician needs to be aware because then it might affect his formula and his analysis of the data. So that's where it's the procedures for accounting uh, missing and uh, data is very important. So you try to have, that's why people say, gee, we're going to close this site because they're not enrolling. And so that really helps, hurts your study. That's why you want to have people enrolling. And then that, that means that you're not going to hire that site again next time when you're running another clinical trial because they didn't produce. Um, so this is very important for you, how you document and do the, the, basically the math and collect the data. So you can go on to the next level of study uh, procedures. Um, next slide, please. Here's a, um, an interesting one. Um, what in here, you in the protocol, you have to state that you need to document clearly that um, there's that I'm running the clinical trial at a site and the investigator and the site members don't have any conflict of interest. Like you have the, there's a form that you have, it's an investigator financial disclosure agreement that needs to be uh, stated. And in part of this, the, um, the uh, questionnaire that the investigator signs out is, do I have any conflict of interest? In other words, do I have a relationship with the sponsor? Have I done other trials and they're always giving me gifts, right? So that's a real no-no nowadays. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Um, I was doing a study for Gilead at one time, and I had to come and qualify a site, and that site was Stanford. And... Um, and um, it was a cell therapy um, study that I was working on. And um, so I got, I thought, oh, gee, yeah, this is going to be easy because, you know, uh, Stanford always has a lot of patient population. So we wanted Stanford and, you know, they have a good name. And Gilead has a good relationship, working relationship with Stanford, blah, blah, blah. So I went to qualify this um, famous physician, the the principal investigator for the study. And as I'm asking her, I'm meeting with her and I ask her the question of, well, conflict of interest. And she goes, well, what do you mean by conflict of interest? I said, you know, have you, do you have any associations with any of the members of this from the sponsor? Or do you have, do you, do you have any patents or do I have, you have any financial, um, do you have a lot of stock from Gilead? And she says, no, but my, my husband, uh, is a doctor at Gilead. <laughs> and so that was like, uh, no, I, you know, so that person who wanted to be the principal investigator and we wanted them to be a, an investigator for us because she was, you know, well known, but unfortunately we couldn't use her. So she had to go find a, she had to go find a co-investigator and the co-investigator had to become the PI, the principal investigator. And she was upset, but you know, those were the rules. And she had not only, she had to identify that individual. And so that, in the, so when Gilead found that out, they contacted the uh, employer, employee, and they, they couldn't look at and have any information to that, um, to that data. So this is very important question that you have to ask and define in the protocol. 
and then also publications and plans if you want if you are mainly an academic site doing a study or even a sponsor you want to participate in in um in uh conferences you need to say where you where you normally are going to be publishing and disclosing this information and where when you're going to be presented the data and what type of data it is um any questions Um, here, you also want to show that how how long the study is for, and uh, quite frankly, here you want to give it a limit. You don't want to if you don't have enough patients for your study, and you and it's gone. It's got the study's been going on for six months. You need to call it off, and so that's why you want to have a short paragraph stating when you plan to complete the study. Now, if it goes over a little bit uh, due to subject enrollment. Um, then it's okay, but you know you don't want to go to you know if it's a six month enrollment period, uh, you don't want to have it be twelve months because that's going to be a no no. And then of course you can reference any information, background information as you're writing your protocol that would substantiate your your hypothesis for writing the protocol and studying the patient population that you're working with. Um, any questions? All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we, we have like less than one minute left. So perfect timing. Oh, Sonia. I was so going you. fast. <laughs> yeah, so. no, that was great. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. If you have questions, feel free to email me and, um, and I'll pass them on to Sonia. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Bye-bye.